Good morning, everybody. Glad you're here today. Would you turn in your Bible to Luke chapter 11? We're going to be in the first 13 verses today. Ever felt like you were um, not the prayer person that you wanted to be? And it's interesting, about 20 hands went up, the rest of you are pros at it, right? <laughs> It's interesting that even if I talk to people that are really schooled and trained, and I would consider prayer warriors, they answer, like, I wish I knew how to pray better. I'm a a little bit amazed by that because we have some people in our our church that are just wonderful, and I learn from them every time we gather. But that's not um, too far off base because the text that we're going to talk about today is people that were traveling around with Jesus. I mean, his disciples were with him 24-7 for at least three years. And we really don't know how early on this is in their journey with Jesus. But they've been with him for some time. In fact, they've seen him throughout his ministry praying. They know that he escapes when they don't want him to. They're looking for him, I'm sure. And they find him tucked away on some mountainside or in some secluded place and He's praying. They've seen him pray. They've seen him actually in prayer. And that transfiguration happens. And Jesus looks different. And So some of them have really seen Jesus pray. And I know that they're challenged by his ability to touch God's heart. And I I know that, um, again, for me in my my life, I've always felt insecure about my prayer life. How do I I pray? How do I uh, touch the heart of God? I want to be in His presence. I want to know Him. I want to experience Him. But how do I do do all that? And so we come to this, this passage, and I think probably... The disciples' desire was bubbling over a little bit. So let's, let's look at the text. It says this, One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. Surprise, surprise. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. Can we say that? Lord, teach us to pray. I hope that's a prayer of ours. Just as John taught his disciples. He said to them, When you pray... Say, Father. I wanted to stop right there. Just say that with me, Father. I have um, a really good dad. In fact, I had a really good father-in-law, and my stepdad was a wonderful man as well. But the one that I, I know the most is the one that I got to hang out with the first 18 years of my life. My dad's not perfect by any means, but he was a godly man. He still is. We were in church all the time. We read the scriptures together. We talked about the scriptures. We talked about the Bible. We were encouraged to walk in his presence. When I was in high school, my latter years, my dad and I lived just us two together. And we'd spend lots of nights together just talking about the Bible, talking about end times or whatever it would be. We were in the scripture. We really were dependent on his presence. I have a a great relationship with my dad. And unfortunately, I think in a lot of ways, um, some of us come to the table in our relationship with God with maybe not that great of a relationship with our earthly father. And sometimes I think that that can be a hindrance when it comes to our prayer life. It struck me this week as I was preparing that the first word of this prayer, the Lord's Prayer, we all know this prayer, right? Is Father. I think Jesus was saying something very, very important to the life of anybody that wants to pray. And it's simply this, when we come to pray, when we come to our 
time that we spend with him, whether it's by ourselves in our cars, whether it's in the morning, whether it's the evening, where, whatever time that it may be, the foundational thing we really need to wrap our hearts and minds around that is, is that God is our Father. This, for sure, is, like I say, a challenging concept for some of us to understand that God absolutely 100% positively loves me. And He loves you. How great is the Father's love for us that we would be called His children. God wants our best. I think sometimes we think that God wants to punish us. That he's some cosmic character sitting on a big white pearl throne loaded with lightning bolts waiting to chuck one of us, chuck one at us because we've made mistakes. That's not God. That's not the Father. He wants our best. He's working to shape us into His very image, to the image of Jesus Christ. He's intimate in knowing all the details of our lives, our birth, every event that we ever experience, every trial, every temptation, He's keenly aware of. And not some... A uh, helicopter parent way. Constantly nagging. He loves us. He cares for us. In fact, Jesus, our brother, by adoption, is interceding for us. He's praying for us even now. We are the very adopted sons and daughters of the Most High God. I say that a lot because there's something significant about that. Most of you know that we have um, two children from uh, from adoption from China, and we're on our way, hopefully soon, to Vietnam. A couple of things happened maybe this week, so we'll see what happens. So adoption for me has something very personal, a very interesting understanding. In fact, when we stood in front of a judge. Was it Tessa or was it L? Ellie. One of the things that the judge pulled us aside, he, he basically instructed us. He said, you, you realize that this, this daughter is not necessarily your blood, but she is your daughter legally forever. In fact, our two adopted children have more rights to inheritance than our biological daughters do. We can write the bios out of the will. We can write the bios out of the will. But we can't... Ellie, you're in for all my football cards and you know my, my Packer collection. We can't write them out of the will because they have rights as adopted daughters in our family that even the bios don't have. I have a, I had a friend. His name was Sumo. He was a big, a big Hawaiian cross Japanese guy. He lived in Hawaii. He was a, a crazy Christian pastor, one of my best friends. And after we'd had Tess and Ellie for a number of years, he pulled me aside one time. And he talked like in Hawaiian, brada, brada. He called me cane man. (laughs) Cane man. He said, what is it about your daughters, man? And I go, what are you talking about, bro? What are you you saying? He goes, no, Tessa and Ellie. He said, I don't get it. And I go, what do you mean you don't get it? He goes, do you feel different about them? And I go, what do you mean? He says, well, I know how I feel about my biological kids. I love them. And I'll, he says, but do you feel different? 
And it was a really interesting question because I'd never really even contemplated it before. And I, I, I looked him in the eye and I said, bro, I actually forget that they're adopted. Like, when you said that to me, I'm like, oh, yeah, they are. I forgot. Now, I mean, if you look around, you see that we're not quite the same. But my love for them... There's no difference. Not one shred of a difference. I love them as my very own. All those feelings and emotions that go with having children is exactly the same. Because of what Jesus did, you realize that we have been adopted into the very family of God and we are the sons and daughters of the Most High. And the inheritance that belongs to the very Son of God now belongs to us as well. Wrap your head around that a little bit. Wrap your head around how much the Heavenly Father loves Jesus. And realize that he loves us the same way. Now what does that have to do with prayer? Everything. Because if you realize how much God really loves you. How much the Father really loves you. And how he perceives you. As his very son and daughter. And that understanding helps us as we enter into his presence and we ask for things. We're not asking of some impersonal being that lives millions of miles away, tucked away on some throne someplace. We're asking, we're talking to, we're relating to the very creator of the entire universe who has loved us and he wants to provide for our very needs so when we come to pray we're not asking some foreign being some alien something we're asking a loving father the second thing that I wanted to highlight this morning is the next phrase hallowed be your name Let's read the prayer. Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. Luke truncates that prayer. The word hallowed be your name has been interpreted a lot as hallowed or holy is your name. And how many of you realize that God's name is holy? It is. But this is also the potential to translate this phrase is potentially a little bit different. In fact, there are scholars that are wrestling with this very concept in the passage that we're going to go into in just a little minute. There's an understanding about this passage that is actually changing. When we understand culture, when we understand the use of words... Even the understanding of certain passages may change. Not that the truth is changing, but a new understanding of it. One of the meanings of the word hallowed is also honored. How many of you know that God's name is honored and respected? Yes, it is. If you look at the the actual word for this in the Greek, it can mean honored as well. And how many of you realize that in this day and age, an honor-shame culture is primary culture, right? Everybody in this culture, was seeking after honor. You lived in a family. Your goal was to to honor the patriarch. You never did anything to dishonor the patriarch. There was a very um, honor and shame-centered culture. You never wanted to do things bad because you would be looked upon bad in the community. You always wanted to do things right because you wanted to bring honor to your name and to everybody up the food chain from you. That's a pretty known 
understanding of their culture. In fact, it's not too much different in many of the Middle Eastern countries of today. Very strong honor-shame culture. Father, honored be your name. Respected, held in awe, trusted. That's what it can mean. May your name be held in high honor. May it be respected. May it be trusted. So this idea of honor and shame in the name of Jesus is a primary thought in, again, biblical understanding and biblical, biblical culture. Look, I want to I read Ezekiel 36 to you, 21 through 23. This is what God said. I had concern for my holy name, which the people of Israel profaned among the nations where they had gone. Therefore, say to the Israelites, this is what the sovereign Lord says. It is not for your sake, people of Israel, that I'm going to do these things, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you have gone. I will show the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, the name you have profaned among them. Did anybody get the idea who profaned the name of God? The Israelites did. They did all sorts of dumb things and they were called by his name and they shamed the name of God. They tarnished his reputation as they're associating with him as God, as their their God. They're doing dumb things all the time. And people are saying, well, I don't want to worship that God, God, because his people are dopes. Brian Kane translation of the Bible. Look what he says in verse 23. I will show the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, the name you have profaned among them. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the sovereign Lord, when I have proved holy through you before their eyes. You see, God will protect his name and his reputation, his honor. And then Jesus says this, verse 5. Then Jesus said to them, suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. So here's what the, the context is. It's a small community. The houses are built very close together. They don't have triple pane glass that is soundproof. And when someone talks to you from your front porch, guess who hears? All of your neighbors. And you have a friend that comes in the middle of the night, unexpected, and he's hungry. Now, if we follow the story or the parable that Jesus is saying... You have a friend, you go to that friend, and you knock on the door. Everybody and their dog in the little small community is going to hear you knocking on the door and say, Friend, I got somebody that came over to my house at midnight. I need some bread. Will you give it to me? That represents the person that is praying. Who is God in this story? Anybody want to venture a guess? The person inside the house. So if we look at this chapter, or we look at this story, and we try to look through the eyes of the traditional translation, what kind of God is there? One who's asleep, one who's lazy, one who does not want to get up in the middle of the night and provide for his neighbor. Is that the God that you know? No. I need some bread because I have a friend that came over. I tell you that he will not get up and give you bread because of friendship, yet because of shameless audacity. That's what the scholars... In fact, that's changed even since I've been around. That verbiage has changed, and it's going to go even farther. You're going to see that this concept is going to come into the New Testament here very shortly. That's what the scholars are saying. What is this saying? In an honor-shame culture, what is Jesus saying in prayer? Come to me as my Father, 
And my name and reputation is on the line. Why does the, the guy in the middle of the house answer the guy that's knocking on the door? Because if he gives a lame excuse and said, look, friend, I'm not going to give you anything because it's late. Then everybody in that little community is going to know. You're not a part of this community. It, honestly, in this culture, that interpretation makes no sense. Makes no sense. And it really has nothing to do with the audacity of the person knocking. It actually has everything to do with the fact that God is going to honor his name. Does that make sense to what I'm saying to you? It's not our shameless audacity. We don't have to sit and beg God for things that we need. We don't beg God for bread. Because this is what we have to do. It's because of the shameless audacity. We keep knocking. I don't believe that this story at all is about continuing to be persistent. Now, maybe the other chapters in the Bible that have this in here are talking about persistence. But what is it saying? I believe that Jesus is saying this simply this. Why does he want to answer prayer? Because he wants to restore the respect and honor of his name, and that he is a respectable and honorable God, and he wants to answer our prayer. So I say to you, why? Because we are in relationship with God the Father, and he is wanting to guard his reputation and keep his name holy and respected. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks the door will be open. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will he give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? When we come to a loving Father that wants to give good gifts to His children, and we come with the understanding that it's God's reputation on the line. Is God able to answer? Absolutely. Does he want the reputation like that with the Israelites spoiled that he can't deliver? Absolutely not. So God has a motivation to protect his honor. So when we come to him, we can come to him as father. And because he has a reputation to keep. Now I know that that sounds interesting to some. But he will protect his name and his honor. He will be honored in all the earth. So when we come to, an, to, come to pray, he wants to answer. Your kingdom come. Do you think that's a prayer that God wants to answer? Do we need to beg God for his kingdom to come? His kingdom is going to come whether we pray or not. Right? His kingdom is going to come whether we pray or not. We want to pray that because we want to pray God's heart. When we pray for daily bread, does God want to give us daily bread? In fact, this parable, Jesus said, if you ask for fish... Are they going to give you a snake? That's not a good dad. I've never, ever in my entire life, when my kids asked me for special pot pies, went outside and dug up a bunch of worms and put them on a plate for them. Never once. When we went to Little Caesars last night, it was a, we voted on it. We were going to go to Little Caesars. 
Not once did I go down and get a boatload of broccoli and just say, hey, I know you asked for pizza, uh, for pizza, but we're just going to have broccoli today, although I don't mind broccoli. Who, who does that? So when we come to praying for his kingdom to come for daily bread, he wants to give us that. How many of us have to beg God for forgiveness? That's not the God that I serve. If we confess our sins, He is what? Faithful and just to forgiveness. If we beg until we can't stand it anymore, God's going to finally get tired of hearing our prayer. And He's going to finally, golly, do I have to answer your prayer? not the God that I know. In fact, I think he's very quick to forgive. And when we come and understand that when we're asking to be free from temptation, do you think God wants us to be making mistakes, sinning all the time? These are the types of prayers that I believe that God wants to quickly answer. Because we see him as heavenly father. And we know that he's protecting his name and reputation. That at the end of the day, he will be honored in and through our lives. Because it's not what we have done, how audacious we've been. But because of how faithful he is.